that Ukraine could collapse, the more willing we are to supply just about anything short of uh, nuclear weapons. So uh, the, the problem, of course, with the F-16 is I don't know who's going to fly them. So my great concern is that uh, there'll be U.S. pilots who, quote unquote, volunteer to do so. And I think that would be very dangerous and ill-advised, but I, I don't see how else we do it. The uh, president uh, announced, well, uh, I'll let him, uh, we'll listen to him. Here's President Biden from Hiroshima on the F-16s. The United States, together with our allies and partners, is going to begin training Ukrainian pilots in fourth generation fighter aircraft, including F-16, to strengthen Ukraine's air force as part of a long-term commitment to Ukraine's ability to defend itself. What does fourth generation uh, aircraft mean? Uh, well, your F-35 is fifth generation. In other words, it's a new generation of, of aircraft technology. Fourth is uh, what most of the modern states of the world possess right now, particularly in Europe and Japan, Korea. So fourth is probably the best that we can provide. Uh, we can't provide, obviously, an F-35. That's a much more challenging piece of equipment, nor do I think we would. But uh, the F-16 is certainly a match for almost anything the uh, Russians put up in the air. But again, how, do, how does this work? We're going to train pilots. It takes months and months. Some people would argue years, but certainly months for someone to train effectively on, on a complex piece of equipment like the F-16. What, what kind of a relationship do we have uh, with our NATO allies? Because this is, as I understand it, Colonel, the president of the United States authorizing Germany, which already has American manufactured F-16s to deliver those F-16s to Ukraine. Are, are they sold on a circumstance whereby they can't go to another country without the approval of the, of the U.S. government? Yes. Yeah. When we uh, provide technology that's uh, of a sensitive nature, whether it's Patriot missiles or uh, fourth generation aircraft, F-16s, F-15s, there are always uh, conditions built into the contract that make it clear that if your plan is to simply sell this to someone else or pass it on to someone else, you can't do it without our permission. So is it likely that Ukraine uh, pilots will be trained in time or, God forbid, American pilots will be there in time while there's still a military operation on? Or is it likely by the time these F-16s arrive or there are human beings there qualified to fly them, the war will be over? Well, I think it's all of the above. Uh, I don't think there are going to be any Ukrainian pilots available anytime soon. Remember that you need specific airfields with specifically designed runways for these aircraft. You have to have some sort of logistical infrastructure, ground crews, people that are trained to maintain them. I, I don't see any of that happening in the short run. So it could well be over before any of that arrives. But in the meantime, that doesn't exclude the possibility that we do, in fact, uh, ask for, quote unquote, volunteers who are willing to fly these things on behalf of Ukraine. And I would remind everybody, just, just to keep this in mind, we have British soldiers, or at least British citizens, who've been captured by the Russians. And right now, they're going to go on trial in, I think, the, one of the republics, the Donetsk Republic, and are going to be treated, at least initially, as mercenaries, not as legitimate uh, com combatants. So if these people show up in, in other than American uniform and they're shot down, which is very likely if they fly over integrated air defenses, then they'll be treated as mercenaries. And there, there's nothing in the Geneva Convention that protects mercenaries. Well, if you look at Bakhmut right now from the air, to be perfectly blunt, it looks a lot like Hiroshima. Uh, mm -hmm. There isn't much left. And the area that was holding out on the edge of the uh, town was a couple of it consisted of a couple of uh, concrete reinforced buildings that stood up remarkably well against uh, you know Russian fire. And the other problem the Russians had is the fear that there were Russian civilians in the basements because the Ukrainians had kept <clears throat> and forced Russian civilians into the basements. Remember, these people that are living in eastern Ukraine are really Russians, and the Ukrainians had always had trouble with Russian citizens there living in Ukraine during the war effectively informing the Russians as to what they were doing. 
Mm. So the Ukrainian forces had the habit of shoving civilians into the basement, keeping them under guard. And so there was a fear on the Russian side that if they went in and just obliterated the buildings, that they would end up killing an unknown number of uh, Russians in the basement that they obviously weren't interested in killing. So all of this combined to st string out this battle much longer than should have been the case. 97, 98% of Bakhmut has been under Russian control now for months. This is the last portion. It's now clear. And I think uh, it's, it's not an exaggeration to suggest that in many ways, the Russian uh, high command turned Bakhmut into the graveyard of the Ukrainian army. And years from now, when we look back on this war, I think Bakhmut will occupy a special place as having been a turning point. Well, I was just going to ask you, why does uh, Bakhmut matter? The city itself uh, is gone. Is this going to be a, an enormous demoral? Will this have an enormous demoralizing effect on the surviving Ukrainian soldiers and the Ukrainian high command? Well, the Ukrainians already had their problems with morale. I mean, you can't take the kind of beating that they have for months without your morale sinking. Uh, I pay tribute to them all the time for their courage, but you're also running out of soldiers. I, I think Bakhmut became to Zelensky in many ways what Stalingrad became to Hitler. Mm. Remember, Stalingrad really did not have any strategic value at the point in time when the, the Germans arrived there. The only thing of value there was an aviation manufacturing facility, a big factory that built aircraft. That had been destroyed by the Luftwaffe. So... There was really no reason to stay in Stalingrad when it became clear what the Soviets were going to do. But Hitler was obsessed with the place and felt that this was a, a grudge match of sorts with Stalin and with communism. And so he turned Stalingrad literally into a disaster. I think uh, that's what Zelensky has done. And of course, Sorovikin back in the fall, in October, November, December timeframe, was the one who said, fine, let's uh, establish this. As a trap, let's invite as many Ukrainians in who, who want to come. So there was always an intention to leave a road out uh, because that road could be used to resupply. And it worked. So thousands of Ukrainian soldiers have died there for nothing at this point. You have uh, an article coming out soon uh, for which I'm privileged to have an advanced copy arguing that at least 50,000 Ukrainian soldiers died in this vain attempt to save this uh, former city. Uh, is that a confirmable a number? It's an enormous number. Is it confirmed? Well, if you go back to the September, October timeframe and, and forward from that and look at the massive number of Ukrainian forces that have been sent into the place, I mean, you can go online and I think Larry Johnson is one example, but there are others who have published the lists of formations, Ukrainian army formations, regiments, battalions, battle groups, and so forth that have been fed into the place. And if you say that most of them went in there at say 50% strength, you run the numbers, you come up with all, close to 50,000 dead. If you say that they went in there at 75% or higher, you come up with an even larger number. I don't think we're going to have any confirmable numbers on a lot of things until this war is over. But I think it is not by any means unreasonable to stick with a 50,000 number, which, which seems to be widely used right now by those people examining specific units that have gone into uh, Bakhmut. Colonel, has uh, General uh, Zaluzhny, the uh, commander of Ukrainian forces, been seen uh, in public since the 1st of May? And are there any rumors about why he has not been seen? Well, we, we're getting things through various sources on the ground in Ukraine, uh, seeping out to the Russians as well as to the West, suggesting, first of all, he wasn't killed after all, but that he was severely, severely wounded. And as a result, he's supposedly been through several operations to save his life. And those appear to have been successful. But we have no, once again, we have no way of knowing, uh, absolutely no way of knowing what, whatsoever. And so Zaluzhny is either dead or he is, as they described, recovering from his wounds. But in any case, I doubt that we'll see him in command of anything in the future. He was just, it's unlikely at this stage. 